WBCB presents Pro Wrestling Weekly. The longest running pro wrestling radio talk show in the history of terrestrial radio. And he's obviously Michael Cole. Call in with a question or comment at 215-949-3232 or 888-922-2149. Talking wrestling. Yeah. Because that's what this show is about. That's what we've been doing for over 16 no, no, years. No, no, no. It's about sports entertainment. And now here are your hosts of Pro Wrestling Weekly. Ferran Derry and Lucas DeSangro. Will you stop marking out over there? Sorry. Move over, kid. I'm taking your microphone. You're shallow. You know that. <laughs> I'm running on two hours of sleep. I don't remember what the hell I do anymore. There's the sound of the bell, and we are set to go. This is Pro Wrestling Weekly here on 1490 WBCB and online at WBCB1490.com. Ferran Derry here alongside Lucas, who uh, had to quick run and errand here inside the studio. But uh, what can I say? He's... Uh, while he can't be here with us in spirit, he is here in person today. Uh, none other than Lucas Twitch to Sangro. Let me pull your... Very funny. There we go. Get the right mic there. Thank you, Ferran, for that wonderful, marvelous introduction. Oh, of course. I uh, actually got it from, uh, uh, I think it was from I've Got a Secret, but that's, uh, that's a whole other story here. It's a very, I'm going to have to think, I'm going to I'm gonna have to save that one. That one's, that's actually really good. Yep. Uh, the great Gary Moore came up with that. Here's the worst part, though, about that, is I had a bit of a nightmare I'm not going to lie. I woke because, like, you know, I had to be up early for work. I woke up really early. But I had a nightmare that I woke up and the I looked at the time and it was 2.11 in the afternoon. And instinctively I would have thought, crap, I'm going to be late for call time. Instinctively not thinking that, oh, wow, you piece of, you know. You know what? Mm -hmm. you, you know, you only also would have missed your job and the radio show, but... That's all right. We, I, I think time has determined where your, uh, where your priorities lie around here. So it's. Oh, uh, Ferran, don't do that to me. That was only in dream sequence. That was only, only dream me. Only, only in dream you. Okay. Yes. Well, I was only dreaming. I see. Well, uh, let's see if we can get you back to reality here. Ah. <laughs> And uh, let's uh, let's get to the, I was gonna say let's get to the guest of honor here. Enough of your usual. Uh, I know that you're making up for lost time here, but uh, we've got a very special guest on the line here. Uh, uh, a great from uh, uh, well, I was gonna say from the uh, from the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s. Uh, one of the uh, the carpenters of professional wrestling, none other than Big Ron Shaw. Ron, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, man. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. And hey, guess what? No hurricanes this time, huh? Yes. As, as I'm speaking, there's something brewing in the south of Cuba there. And uh, fortunately, there's a cold front here that may push it out. We don't know if it's going to be a tropical storm. But, you know, you and I had talked about, uh, you know, rescheduling the show. And I just said, hey, let's let's do it towards the end of the hurricane season. And, uh, you know, you know, hopefully we can get lucky like, like we are today. But, you know, hey, let, let, me, let me touch real quick on, on that Hurricane Irma and so forth. You know, it was, it was a, you know, such a devastating hurricane, and, and, you know, Key West got hit hard with storm surge, and, and the beautiful island of Puerto Rico got just, you know, totally wiped out. And, you know, and it was, you know, I've been to Puerto Rico so many times to wrestle there in the San Juan. I've seen old San Juan and gone through the countryside and so forth. And, it, and, you know, it's such a shame. But, you know, one thing about these hurricanes, you know, when Florida is in the crosshairs of it, and it's such a large storm as it was, you know, you have to stop doing what you're doing. You know, your everyday routine changes. You know, and, and me, you know, I, I, you know, I love golf and I love working out and so forth. And then it becomes a mental, mental thing. You go to bed tired, you wake up in the middle of the night, and you start thinking about a Category 5 hurricane and where is this thing going to, you know, actually hit. And, you know, they, they change every single day. But, you know... We got through this storm, no problem, and, uh, you know, it was mainly a win. We lost electric for a couple of days, but, you know, you know, you wipe your brow and say, whew, that was a close one. And, you know, you go back to your regular routine. I, you know, went back to golfing and, and, and working out, you know, which is, these are the things I'm passionate about. You know, I'm going to be 60 years old November 5th. You know, and I, and I work out like a maniac. Matter of fact, I just converted over the last four weeks one of my rooms into a, into a gym, and I 
you know, all free weights, Olympic weights. I got the mirrors on the wall and, and paddings on the floor and to give it that real gym atmosphere because, you know, where I live in a gated community, we have fitness centers and the majority of it is machines. And I've worked out with machines mainly for the last 10 years. So I wanted to go back to my roots of how I used to work out. And, and you know, I even put on some size this year. I was working heavier and put on about 10, 12 pounds of some good weight and some bad weight. But that's the way it goes when you get to be an old guy like myself, you know. But, um, yeah, yeah, that's just the way it is down here in hurricane uh, uh, areas. Man, well, that's, uh, I mean, it's good to hear that everything uh, that turned out all right. I know there was a lot of concern, and uh, I'm glad that uh, Philippe decided to uh, have a little bit of a delay here before, uh, uh, before getting in so you were able to, uh, uh, to get you in here. And uh, free weights, hmm, Twitch. Uh, now, I was going to say, I know my dad's c- considering converting my room into that as soon as I, uh, as soon as I move out. So, um, Dad? I want you to rethink that, please. <laughs> All right. I, 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 I love being at the house. I'm sure you don't, but um, that's just beside the point. I'm broke. I'm not going to be moving out. Well, you know, hey, you, you, you may hit it big. And you know what? He's going to call you back home, and uh, you might be supporting him. Yeah. Hey, Lucas, help me move this bench, please. It uh, used to be where your bed was. There we go. Anyway, we're uh, we're talking with uh, with with Big Ron Shaw, who uh, I mean, uh, uh, such a, a dossier, a who's who of uh, of who you've uh, uh, taken on and competed against uh, for the World Wide Wrestling Federation and uh, the World Wrestling Federation uh, throughout the the seventies and eighties. I mean, just looking at some of the names. I mean, Pat Patterson, Hulk Hogan, Pedro Morales uh, mm-hmm. on quite a few occasions. Uh, uh, Jesse Ventura, um, Andre the Giant. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just like skimming through here. The fabulous Freebirds. I mean, I don't even know where yeah. to where to start. And, and, and just looking at all these names here. And, oh. and let's not even leave out uh, the great Bobo Brazil, who I wrestled in Baltimore, and Ernie the Big Cat Lad when mm. I first came in to start doing TV uh, in the WWF. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a couple of guys right there who are just you know the big names in the business too. And I and I've always claimed that I've I've wrestled the biggest. Names in the business, you know, right down to Dusty Rhodes and Mill Mascaris, and um, yeah, I mean, it was a fabulous career for me. Yeah, of course, there's some ups and downs in the career and so forth, and I think everybody has that too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I talk about that. I, mean, uh, I, well, I was going to say where to, where to talk about here. Uh, I mean, uh, competing in in such hallowed grounds like Madison Square Garden. Uh, I mean, countless times. Uh, I mean, here in the Philadelphia area, we uh, we know the Spectrum. Uh, very well, and and some of the uh, the the numerous matches, including one that uh, I know you tend to to talk about a lot, and uh, we don't have to delve too much into it. But the uh, the Phantom Submission with uh, with David San Martino, that's right. right. And, and who I've I've dubbed it also as the big upset because, um, as some people may know and some people don't know, I started my own website back in 2015, and. Uh, the newspapers started calling me about that, and, and uh, I dubbed it the big upset. And uh, matter of fact, you know, while I'm talking about my website real quick, you know, anybody who hasn't checked it out, go to bigronshawwwf.com. And uh, there, there's a lot of stuff on there. And there you know, there's radio interviews, there's um, newspaper clippings from the past, posters, programs, and, and uh, a lot of my upset matches are on there, even one with Rene Goulet. And... Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting reading, you know, and, and uh, especially fan posts who are still talking about the Shaw San Martino match 32 years later. And I just, matter of fact, I just found those a couple of days ago and uh, put up the new ones on my website. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, I mean, uh, looking currently uh, with the uh, the talk of the JFK files, it seems like there's so many differing opinions on what happened that night and uh, and uh, where just uh, out of nowhere, out of a, a bear hug, all of a sudden, uh, San Martino had submitted, and uh, you know, for those who haven't seen the video, uh, there's a you can check it out on YouTube as well as going to uh, Ron's website, bigronshawwwf.com. Uh, but you, you could hear Gorilla Monsoon uh, almost chiding or chastising the referee for for making the call of the submission. Yeah, there and there was no reason to because you know as I say, you know when David waved his hands uh, there was no question about it that he gave up and uh, you know as I say when you when you read all those opinions and that that's all they are they are opinions you know David had given an interview maybe 10 15 years ago I don't know what it was exactly and that's what people were kind of feeding off of a little bit so when you read 
some of those posted views, uh, you, you can you can see that. Well, okay, yeah, this is this is what David was talking about in the match, and uh, you know, I just as I say a couple of years ago started giving my version of it, and uh, you know, I won't I won't get into that now. But you know, I, I I've got some you know, and I'm sure we'll talk about it maybe a little bit later in the show. But you know, you know, I I got some you know fantastic stories, and I know you were telling me that you know. Uh, in the late 70s. No, I, I actually started wrestling in 1980. I, I wish I could have been part of the late 70s because uh, I would have loved to have wrestled in the old Philadelphia Arena at 46th and Market because I used to go there all the time when I was in high school with my friends and and go to the TV tapings there and then even go to the uh, the big house show, which was held there once a month and so forth, and, and seen some fantastic talent. And, and wrestling, you know, and uh, always getting the ringside seat around where the, you know, baby, the heels came out pretty much. And, you know, I was always a fan of Dick the Bulldog Brower, Larry the Axe Henning. And at a time, a, a guy who came in here, his name was Iron Mike McCord, who eventually changed his name to, oh, God, I forget. Man, there's probably wrestling fans out there. No, I, I can't remember everything. I'm not the historian that I, I think I am about the business, but, you know, you know, I've watched it since I was eight years old, so, you know, I, I got a lot of knowledge about that, but, yeah, I, I wish I would have been a part of that, that Philadelphia arena scene, uh, but, yeah, no, I didn't actually start wrestling until I was uh, uh, 23 years old. I got trained by Killer Kowalski uh, uh, 16 weeks up in Salem, Massachusetts, and, uh, you know, at the end of the 16 weeks, I told Walter, hey, I want to go to work for the WWF, and uh, Gorilla Monsoon gave me a call shortly after I returned back home to Philadelphia, I said, hey, Ron, come on up to Allentown, do some TV tapings. You know, I started going up there, and uh, uh, I'd, I'd, show, I'd show up every three weeks, and then they told me to go to Hamburg. And uh, uh, next thing you know is I started going to all the uh, spot shows in the Jersey area, uh, just in case. You know, I took my bags with me. I said, uh, and, and Gorilla Monster was from Burlington, New Jersey, where he lived. And uh, so he was the agent in all those little shows and so forth. So every once in a while, somebody wouldn't show up, and he says, hey, Ron, got your stuff? I said, sure do. And... Uh, there I was. I was. I'd be working. So they started booking me at the end. Uh, I guess I could. It could have been maybe about September or November. They started booking me in smaller shows and so forth. So I was starting to make uh, make some money. And early 1981 came along, and I was at a show booked at a show at the Allentown Fairgrounds where they have the uh, Allentown Fair once a year. And Vince McMahon Sr. was there, and he called me downstairs, and he said, you know, he goes, Ron, he goes, you're a natural at this business. And I said, wow. I said, you know, to myself, I said, wow, that's quite a compliment, you know. And I said, here I am. I'm just this, this green guy. I didn't think anything special about myself, you know. And he said, are you able to travel? I said, I certainly am, sir. So they started booking me all around the territory. And then uh, a little time after that in 81, uh, Gorilla Monsoon said, hey, Ron, he goes, get yourself at the Royal Blue Executioner's outfit like Walter and uh, John Studd used to wear when they were the tag team champions. And uh, so I had gotten that, and uh, they told me to bring it up to a TV taping, and uh, they started uh, putting me on TV. I got one of those matches, actually, on, on, uh, on my website. And uh, so uh, I was wrestling as the masked executioner. Then they started booking me in house shows throughout 81. And I was going into Madison Square Garden against Mill Mascaris. I was, I was wrestling, I mean, everywhere else uh, through 81, uh, pretty much against Pedro Morales and Tony Atlas. And some of the best matches I had were with Pedro Morales. I mean, you know, many, many of the times that we've met on TV. And, uh, you know, I think, I think at a point where he says, well, you know, this, this kid can work and so forth. And we had some of the best matches we've ever had. And, and I think one of the best matches was in Connecticut and the New Haven Coliseum, or it might have been the Hartford Civic Center. And, you know, the place is packed, and, and me and Morales were outside. We're working outside the ring and, and inside. And it was such a, such a great match that when I came back to the dressing room, I mean, a lot of the boys back there were in a great match, Ron. Yeah, Mr. Fuji, oh, very good match, very nice match, you know. And um, then I know Vince was there because, you know, the office was just down the road pretty much there. And uh, so, you know, those, those were some of the great matches that I had. And uh, I, had, I had learned a little bit later on in 1981, uh, they had a plan for me. And uh, they said that they were going to send me to California to work for the Mike LaBelle promotions. I said, well, hmm. So this is this is going to be interesting here, and you know here I am. I've been working uh, 
uh, since 1980 through 1981, and I was supposed to go in 1982 sometime, I guess, after the holidays. And, you know, I, I wasn't 100% sure that I wanted to go, so I started asking opinions uh, from certain, you know, certain wrestlers and certainly Killer Kowalski and so forth. But the negatives outweighed the positives, and I chose not to go. And uh, I, I, had, I had told, I, I don't know, I might have been Gro Monsoon or Arnold Scullin or, or both of them, I told them I wasn't going to go. Uh, so I was on a tour in upstate New York doing Rochester, Utica, Buffalo, and uh, I was told the night before to give Vince Jr. a call. So I was in my hotel, uh, you know, I guess it was in Rochester, it was probably the last, last show of that tour, and I gave Vince a call. And, uh, you know, Vince being really, really nice about it, he says, Ron, he goes, I understand that you're not going to go out to California. I said, yeah, Vince, I, you know, I just decided not to go. And, you know, was I, you know, immature as far as uh, um, that, may, you know, a decision deciding, hey, maybe I can just stay here, keep working here. And, and you know, because you know, I was making fantastic money because I was getting booked constantly, you know. And or go out to California and hear that, you know, it's not as good out there. And he says, you know, sometimes you just have to, you know, you have to go and, you know, you have to do these things if you're going to, you know, stay long in a business. And he says, well, look, he goes, make tonight your last night. And I was kind of expecting that. And I said, well, look, Vince, I said, thank you very much. I said, I hope, I, you know, I worked out well for you. And, uh, and that was it. I did my last show and, uh, came back to Philadelphia, and I gave Killer Kowalski a call. And I knew he was booking shows up in the uh, uh, New England area and so forth, so he told me, come on up, because I get to in some shows. And, and he was doing a show called uh, Bedlam from Boston uh, TV, and it was one of the highest rating shows in uh, Sunday morning in, the, in that time slot. So we started doing those, a lot of those shows, and then shortly after that, he, they partnered with Dominic DiNucci, uh in the uh, in, uh, Pittsburgh area and so forth. And uh, they started shifting the TV over there. We started doing it in a couple places uh, in Allentown and, and finally in the uh, Allentown um, Dorney Park. Okay, that's where we were doing the TV tapings. So pretty much through 82 and 83, I was working with those guys and, and um, we were we were we were doing pretty good. They had backers. There were two lawyers doing the backing. Uh, you know, we had such guys as uh, uh, the Valiant Brothers. We brought in the Valiant Brothers, Larry Zabisco, Hans Schroeder, Danucci, um, David San Martino was working as Bruno San Martino Jr. Um, and I had a manager, Wild Bull Curry, who goes way 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 back. And uh, they were using me as uh, Ron the Bandit Shaw. Um, so you know that lasted through '82 and '83, and. Uh, I was very anxious to go back to the WWF. And so, you know, at the end of 83, I decided to give Vince a call. And uh, so I talked to Vince, and he says, well, look, he goes, you know, it, it's up to my father. He goes, uh, he gave me his number because he was in Miami Beach, I guess. And so I gave Vince Sr. a call, and he said, Ron, he goes, well, you know, he goes, we're, we're pretty much – at our limit of guys, but you know what? He goes, we'll, we'll bring you back. So, you know, go up to the next taping, and boom. I was working pretty much steady through 84, 85, and into 1986. And this was the longest run I ever had, okay? And uh, towards 86, half of 86, they brought a new booker up uh, from the South. I think his name was George Scott and so forth. And, you know, the wrestling business is political, Okay, so he brought up a you lot of his guys. Say. From, yeah, <laughs> so you know he brought up a lot of his guys, and I saw my booking starting to drop. Well, you know I, I've been there already two and a half years, and at that point I said, you know, I said I had gotten a call from Rick Martel because Rick left there to go back up to Montreal and work with the international wrestling up there. So I came up there to do a tour. And, uh, and and actually the uh, you know he was working with Dino Bravo, but uh, but Rick was the booker actually, and I, he, he brought me up there for a tour and, and you know it, it was it was good we were doing TV also and and I matter of fact I got one of those matches on there with Rick uh, uh, from Montreal there, and uh, uh, I was working out pretty good but you know I was coming home because I had other independent promotions that I was booked at. I think I had like about twenty bookings already and there were, and there were more to come and also. I was getting calls from the Crockett promotions, 
and you know to come do a Baltimore show. And matter of fact, uh, AJ Petruzzi, he would uh, uh, get called too. So we'd go down there together and, and, and do some shows. But they were calling me more on a regular basis. And uh, this this was all very interesting because here I am working still for Vince. I'm going up to Montreal and I'm working a little bit for the Crockett Promotions, but nobody's ever said nothing about it. You know, because generally, generally when you go work for another uh, promotion, they don't like that. You know, you're either fired or, or, or something. So um, Rick had called me back and says, hey, do you want to come up here on a permanent basis? And I said, Rick, I said, you know, Rick Martel, I said, you know, I got a lot of bookings down here, Rick. You know, and, and you know, it's so less inexpensive to live at home and, uh, you know, not have to put out for a hotel and food and so forth on the home every night. You know, everything I'm doing, he, he, he totally understood. So uh, we, we, you know, I stayed with the promotion and so forth and, and loved Vince. And then in 19, the other half of 1986, uh, there was this NWF that was forming. They were doing TV. And uh, they wanted they wanted a uh, masked uh, heels. And I said, well, I said, I can... Re- you know, reprived the uh, executioner gimmick, and I picked A.J. Petruzzi because, you know, A.J. was close to being my size, the same the same type of build and so forth, and I knew A.J. through, you know, through the years because we did TV together, and, you know, if I traveled up north, you know, I'd just drive with A.J., and if we were going south, he'd just come down to Philadelphia, boom, and we'd drive out that way. So, you know, uh, we were good friends, and we did the mass executioner gimmick for the next two Two years, pretty much what it was, and and even at the time uh, we held a uh, tag team championship there at the NWF, and uh, uh, that was the only title I ever held. And uh, we were also getting bookings. AJ said, uh, "Hey, said so we can get bookings here in other places, but you know we have to go as the Super Destroyers because uh, you know we just didn't want to use the amassed Executioners, being mainly primarily working for the NWF." Uh, so we were getting a lot of bookings, and, and in this NWF, they were bringing in great talent. They brought in Cousin Luke, the Fantastic, Samoans, Wendy Richter, uh, Bruiser Brody, Abdullah the Butcher. Later on, they brought in Sergeant Slaughter. And uh, uh, so they, they had a pretty good thing going. We were getting a lot of work. And, uh, you know, thing, things were starting to go with different directions. And, and uh, 1988, I got asked to do a gimmick uh, as a coal miner for the Galaxy Wrestling Federation. And uh, I think the only way they were promoting that is we were doing a show in this corner with Mike Mittman. Are you familiar with Mike Mittman? Uh, I'll admit that one I'm uh, not as familiar with, but uh, can we, uh, I was going to say, I, I didn't know where exactly to hop in there, but uh, I was going to say we do have, uh, yeah, we do have some commercial obligations we got to take care of. Uh, talking with Absolutely. Big Ron Shaw, uh, former uh, World Wrestling Federation competitor, and uh, I was going to say, just, just the stories and everything are just, uh, I was going to say, there, there's a uh, a whole lot there, and we got a whole lot more to get into. Uh, this is Pro Wrestling Weekly here on 1490 WBCB and online at WBCB1490.com. Chickies and Pete's, your favorite local sports bar with the best in-game experience. Catch all the action and the players at Chickies and Pete's all season long. Live football shows all season featuring the Brandon Graham Show every Monday. Plus, the Chicky and Pete's Players Lounge with Fletcher Cox and many more special guests. Enjoy daily drink specials, signature menu items, and our world famous crab fries. Chickies and Pete's is a proud partner of the Philadelphia Eagles and the official caterer of the Touchdown Club in Lincoln Financial Field. Head to chickiesandpeets.com for the full schedule. Take a stand. Take a stand. Take a stand. Like my brother did when he wouldn't take no for an answer. Like my wife did when she asked the right questions. Like my friend did when she made the call. You stood by us when we were in uniform, so stand by us now. Take a stand for those who served our country. If you're a veteran in crisis, or no one who is, the Confidential Veterans Crisis Line is here for you. Call 1-800-273-8255 and press 1. Chat at veteranscrisisline.net or text 838-255. You won't see termites crawling across your floor, but thousands might be devouring the wood in your walls, weakening the structure of your home. For over 50 years, termite proofing and pest control of the Delaware Valley has been in the exterminating business. If you think you have a pest problem, they're the experts. Call them today at 215-639-5455. That's 215-639-5455 for TPPC. Termite proofing and pest control of the Delaware Valley gives your home or business peace of mind, knowing your pest problem is in their hands. 
Located at 1560 Bristol Pike in Ben Salem, they use only EPA-approved material applied by licensed technicians. Call Termite Proofing and Pest Control of the Delaware Valley at 215-639-5455. Hi, this is Dick Vermeil. Get in the game with Independence Blue Cross. Whether you're a small business owner or an individual, Independence has been providing health coverage you can count on for nearly 80 years. Independence plans are accepted by over 90% of doctors and specialists, so you can live fearless wherever you work or play. I've trusted Independence to protect my family for more than 30 years, and you can trust them too. Take it from me, Independence is a win for you or your business. Visit IBX.com or talk to your broker today. Oh, He's got man. the Luigi death stare from Ferran, so he might have to I start. didn't give you the Luigi death stare. That's Shh, not true. You're breaking cave <laughs> Breaking cape. I'm gonna break <laughs> something else during this commercial. There we All go. Right. That's what I like to see. And now, more Pro Wrestling Weekly with your hosts, Ferran Derry and Lucas DeSangro. Are so we good. getting into that controversy again? <laughs> Ugh, I know how it feels, and it's not fun. Welcome back to Pro Wrestling Weekly here on 1490 WBCB and online at WBCB1490.com. Ferran Derry alongside Lucas Twitch DeSangro and we're talking with Big Ron Shaw, former World Wrestling Federation competitor and a uh, uh, man who has uh, taken on pretty much all the greats. And uh, uh, before the time out here, uh, you were talking about uh, uh, from 1986. Um, wasn't, yeah, I wasn't sure quite where to... Uh, Galaxy to, Wrestling Federation? Yeah, Galaxy Wrestling Federation. Yeah, that was it, yeah. So, yeah, we, 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 uh, we, we did a short stint there for the Galaxy Wrestling Federation. Um, and uh, I pretty much pretty much ended with them after about maybe uh, six or seven months or so forth. Uh, they, they were booking me pretty much up against Mike Sharp, Iron Mike Sharp, as we remember. And uh, you got to remember, we were going into all the coal mining towns because the coal miner gimmick. And man, we we were packing the place. I mean, you know, everybody was rooting for me, you know, as, as the baby face and so forth. And uh, they were putting me over on Mike Sharp everywhere. As, um, has to be expected, and uh, so you know, I, I worked that there for a while. But you know, in 1988, I had uh, I had gotten a call from Adrian Adonis, and uh, Adrian uh, and uh, Dick Murdoch. When we were touring Canada several th- several times, uh, we would always go out after the shows or whatever the VFWs and so forth, and have a beer and this and that and everything like that. Uh, he had left Vince, obviously, so he was working up in Canada, and he was working for an individual called the Bear Man. And I heard Bear, Bear Man several times in, in my years traveling and so forth. And he gave me a call. He says, hey, Ron, he goes, are you interested in coming up here toward the end of, of this summer? And he goes, what we would do is, you know, we're going to do an angle with you. And, and then the following summer, you just come up and, and do the whole stretch of the summer because they primarily only booked during the summer because, you know, the winter's up there are so, so hectic and everything. And uh, I said, uh, I said, yeah, I said, there was really nothing else going on you know at this time and i said decided to take a chance and you know hey i'm gonna move away for a change because I've, I've i've never had to relocate anywhere so far in in the eight years that i was wrestling and uh i said sure absolutely and uh it might have been weeks after that i, I you know i'm gonna forget this is a long time ago i had gotten a call from jack tunney's office that uh that he and uh, the bear man were killed in a tragic accident and uh, they were run off the road, and there was a moose crossing the road. <laughs> and, you know, they were both killed instantly, so they they were going to change the plans and everything and uh, uh, not have me come up there. And uh, that was, I mean, that, that was a blow. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, was, with, with all, you know, so many deaths that have happened in recent years and, and losing a great talent like Adrian Adonis, uh, you know, it's kind of like a shock to me and so forth. So, you know, well, you know, we had to go on and... Uh, uh, you know, 88 was, was probably a slow year, and uh, 89 was coming around, and uh, I had a good friend that I worked out with at uh, CFI's gym there in Philadelphia in the Frankfurt section, or Mayfair section, excuse me, and his name was Larry Winters, he was a big star in the independent circuit, so are you guys familiar with Larry Winters? A uh, little bit of familiarity. Okay. Uh, well, we were good friends, and um, we worked out, I mean, constantly, and I said, I said, Larry, I said, uh, yeah, wouldn't it be interesting to get a, get a wrestling school? And I said, we, you know, we, we were always aware of Larry Sharp's Monster Factory, and, and, you know, not that we were trying to compete 
with, <laughs> with him because you know Larry and you know and you know Larry Larry was a good friend of mine too because you know my early days, you know we would always meet somewhere on the Jersey Turnpike and you know he always would drive. And he had that he had a nice big van and so forth. So we always go to the shows with Larry and Larry was a great guy and uh, we miss him sure and uh, so we decided to get the school together and uh, and I think, I think we were not quite a year just me and Larry and we decided to pretty much uh, uh, hook up with the TWA and uh, uh, we trained we trained some good guys and I think one of the best guys that we trained there and two of the biggest stars that came out of there were the Sandman and JT Smith as a matter of fact, I got uh, matches with those guys on my website. And uh, uh, but before that, you know, before we joined with the TWA, we trained two guys, uh, me and Larry, by ourselves, and we were phys- we were physical trainers and so forth. Uh, we trained a guy named C and Red, uh, and uh, this guy, you know, we didn't know what kind of gimmick that that he would use and so forth. And he asked me, he goes, you know. Would I be a baby face or would I be a heel? I said, well, you know what? When you step into the ring, if they cheer you, you're a baby face. If they jeer you, you're a heel. And you know something? When he stepped into the ring with his cocky attitude, and uh, he was instantly a heel. I mean, this was the type of guy that you just didn't like. <laughs> you know, so so he, you know, it was one of those gimmicks where he just walked in the ring. And then there was this other guy, Doug Flex Yazinski, another guy that we we trained. And he went on to wrestle with the Galaxy Wrestling Federation. He was a manager. He promoted boxing and wrestling and mixed martial arts. And he even has worked with the Special Olympics kids. You know, which is which is a great thing to do and so forth. But you know, we 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 were doing this school, I guess, into ninety one, I guess it was, and I had started soul searching with myself. I said, you know, I said, you know, I'm getting some shows here with the TWA and so forth, uh, but you know, I just saw no future there anymore, and maybe just in wrestling, uh, uh, pretty much, and I considered retiring, you know, and and uh, I really really started thinking about it, you know. And I gave Kowalski a call, and I asked Walter, and I knew Walter was always doing shows, and they were guarantee shows and so forth. And he says, look, he goes, you know, he goes, I've got a commitment to my guys to get them work. You know, if I bring you up there, you know, somebody's not going to work. He says, but let me tell you something. He goes, do you have your passport, and is it up to date? I said, yeah. And he says, okay. He goes, let me, let me call somebody. And, you know, about three weeks later, I had gotten a call from a promoter, and he says, look, he goes, are you interested in doing shows once a month overseas? And I said, absolutely. I said, but, you know, of course, obviously, I need my airfare paid for and hotels paid for and then a guarantee. I mean, it was either that or just, just retire. And he said, yeah, yeah. He goes, you know, look, me and Walter are good friends and everything, and he, he says that, that uh, you know, you're a good hand and everything like that. And he said, well, good hand is, you know... I don't know what kind of, if that was a compliment or not. <laughs> uh, so, so they brought me over, and and before before I you know went, I I had to sever my ties with the wrestling school and so forth because you know if I would have stayed on the wrestling school, uh, I would have had an obligation probably to get some of these guys work, and I could not let anybody know because number one, Walter said one thing to me. He goes, "Look, do not." tell anybody that I did this for you because he also had an obligation, you know, for his guys too. And so I, I told absolutely nobody anything of where I was going, what I was doing. And uh, so we, we started doing these super shows. And when I went over, I think the first uh, place I went, I think it was Australia or New Zealand. And uh, when I got over there, they said, the promoter said, wow, he goes, man, he goes, he goes you're, you're bigger than I thought you were because I was really pushing about 270 at the time. And uh, he says, look, he goes, we'll use you, you know, you'll win the Battle Royal, you'll work with the world champion, and we'll do this and different. So they were working, the guy was working in conjunction with all these wrestling companies everywhere that I had gone, and he, he booked them as super shows. And every every country that I went to, whether it was Japan, and it wasn't, we weren't working for the big promotion in Japan, it was, there, there were maybe about three other promotions in Japan. Mm. So I was going to the Philippines, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and, and a lot of the islands, and and, uh, and it became a five to eight, eight day tour almost every single month. And what 
you know, I think one thing I had learned, I said, you know something? I said, I remember that opportunity that that Vince Sr. wanted to give me, and, and, and I had heard that it was probably going to be something where I was going to do a lot of traveling after California and so forth like that. And I said, it probably would have been a great opportunity to see the world. And uh, here I did end up getting that opportunity in my latter years by just making that last last phone call that I decided to make. So uh, I speak about that now because Walter Kowalski had passed away in 2008. And, uh, uh, you know, mm. let me tell you something. If it wasn't for him, uh, I would have never been here because I, I truly believe to this day that, you know, number one, uh, my connection with Walter helped me with the WWF. Uh, I think Vince Sr., Vince Jr. always liked me uh, because they wouldn't have brought me back in, in 84, uh, especially with their full roster that they had. So, you know, I worked, I worked longer on my second time back, you know, 84, 85, and half of 86. And, you know, they, they still once in a while did call me in the early 90s because uh, if somebody wasn't showing up or something, I'd get a call last minute. But uh, that, that, was, that was pretty much my career. I ended up in uh, 99 retiring, and, and, you know, I always still had a chance to call up Jose Gonzalez in Puerto Rico because he was the booker there. With Carlos Colon, and, and I would always use that as a working vacation to go there to the beaches and and uh, do that. So you know they were they were always you know every place I left, I never burned a bridge, you know. And uh, you know people today have wanted me to do shoot interviews. Well, I've got nothing bad to say about anybody in this business. You know, I I lived out a childhood dream, and I've worked with a lot of the best legends in the business. And you know, as I say, you know, my website is not about me. It's 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 about the great you know the great legends of yesterday. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more stuff I'm going to be putting on there in the months to come and so forth. And I just put on a great match. Uh, if, if there was a top 20 match in the WWF, um, it was with Pat Patterson. And this one's from the Nassau Coliseum in Long Island, New York. And in the beginning, you know, the, the respect that they showed me, the big stars that showed me, Gorilla Monsoon interviews him uh, on this USA Cable uh, network broadcast that it was going to be. And they talk about me. And, and Pat really builds me up in this uh, uh, match, opening match match so you know that's you know these guys were great to me and you know god bless them all man it was, I, I had a fantastic career and i enjoyed it could it have been better yeah could it have been worse absolutely but i was totally satisfied and that's fantastic to hear. I mean, yeah, Pat Patterson, I mean, a Hall of Fame for him to be able to uh, to, to put you in such a, a, a shining light like that uh, i mean it's it's just reciprocity of respect exactly exactly uh, anyway, let's. Uh, I was gonna say, let's take care of our uh, our final time out here. Uh, we're talking with uh, Big Ron Shaw, uh, former World Wrestling Federation wrestler. Uh, uh, love to talk about. Uh, I was gonna say, there's quite a few things to get into. Uh, I know we had talked a little bit about Larry Sharp. We'll get into that on the uh, the other side. Um, also, I uh, was doing some research here, and uh, apparently, you were on the. Uh, it, well, even though it wasn't televised, the uh, the brawl to end it all. We'll uh, we'll get into that on the other side as well. Uh, but first, uh, got to tell you about. Uh, of course, our, our, our friends over at the Broken Goblet Brewery. It's the final Hollow Weekend over at the Broken Goblet Brewery, 1500 Grundy's Lane in Bristol, PA. Uh, the Wheel of Charity is going to be available all day. Also, double feature movies during the day. And Kinky Quizzo returns tonight, always a hot one. Plus, tomorrow it's Sunday, Bloody Sunday, with Bloody Mary flights from noon to 2 and specials during the Eagles game. Just a few reasons why it's always a good time at the Broken Goblet Brewery, 1500 Grundy's Lane in Bristol, PA. Broken Goblet Brewing the semi-official brewery of Pro Wrestling Weekly. Please enjoy responsibly. Coming back, we've got more with uh, with Big Ron Shaw, and uh, we'll wrap everything else up here for, uh, for another crazy week here on Pro Wrestling Weekly on 1490 WBCB and online at WBCB1490.com. Hi, Merrill Reese inviting you to join Delco Times beat reporter Bob Groats and a different eagle each week for the Pro Football Report presented by BCWSA. Listen and watch our video stream on Facebook Live as we broadcast each week from a different Chickies and Peaks location near you and take a look deep inside the game. The Pro Football Report presented by BCWSA every Thursday night from 6 to 7 right here on 1490 WBCB and 610 Sports. Your health is your most precious asset. Tune in to St. Mary Healthline Wednesday at 9 a.m. for advice on how to better manage your health. You will hear about important medical issues from the doctors and professionals across all service lines from St. Mary Medical Center. You will have the opportunity to talk or email your questions to the experts who can help you live a healthier lifestyle. St. Mary Healthline, Wednesdays at 9 a.m. It's your health. Expect more. 
All commentators heard on WBCB expressed their own views. Their opinions are not necessarily those of others on WBCB, including the staff and management. Hi, Tom Mellon from Team Toyota. Remember to listen to our show, Let's Go Places, with Tommy Toyota live here on 1490 WBCB, dedicated to our local hometown veterans, policemen, and firemen. Call me anytime for an appointment at 215-768-6505. That's 215-768-6505 for your exclusively discounted vehicle selection, and $50 will be donated in your honor to our specially selected charities. Stop by and see me, Tommy Toyota, at Team Toyota, Business Route 1, Langhorn. Listen and watch live from the WBCB studios every Wednesday morning at 8.15 a.m. during Foxwell in the morning to the Four Paul's Doggy Daycare Adoptable Pet of the Week. Four Paul's Doggy Daycare is located at 890 West Bridge Street at Snipes Farm in Morrisville, offering daycare, boarding, salon and spa, and training. See the pets available for adoption from area shelters video stream live at WBCB1490.com every Wednesday at 8.15 a.m. You could find your forever pet. Pro Wrestling Weekly presents Today in Wrestling History, October 28. On this date in 1989, the NWA held its Halloween Havoc pay-per-view. In the main event, Ric Flair and Sting defeated Terry Funk and the Great Muda in a Thunderdome tag team match. On this date in 1996, WCW Monday Nitro aired live from Phoenix, Arizona. In the main event, Booker T defeated Lex Luger by countout. On this date in 2002, WWE Monday Night Raw aired live from Detroit, Michigan. In the main event, Kane defeated Triple H in a casket match. On this date in 2012, WWE held its Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. In the main event, CM Punk pinned Ryback in a Hell in a Cell match to retain the WWE Championship. This has been Today in Wrestling History, October 28. Welcome back to Pro Wrestling Weekly here on 1490 WBCB and online at WBCB1490.com. For Andre and Lucas Twitch DeSangro here. Hey. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm just making your presence felt. Drinking it all in. There uh, you honestly, go. I, 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 you know, was... I, I got a question for Lucas. Yes. Oh. Um, Lucas, absolutely, yeah. Uh, I understand you got a big match tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay, let me give you advice. Kick, bite, do whatever you got to do to win a match. Thank you. I, I, I actually do that already. <laughs> okay. Great. I'm not exactly the biggest guy, so I got to use whatever I can. Yeah, well, you know, you know something. I have had a chance to watch uh, you guys on YouTube and so forth, and I and I want to say, you know, you guys are doing a great job there, man. You got a lot of talent there, and, and you guys are in great shape, man. You know, uh, I wish I could look like some of those guys, that, you know, today. But uh, uh, yeah, good luck on your big match tonight. Thank you. I appreciate it. That should okay. be a lot of fun tonight. The uh, the MFPW as it uh, returns to the world famous Monster Factory at 541 Mancho Avenue in Paulsboro, New Jersey, for the MFPW Monster Mash. Uh, you'll see Primal Fear challenge the Money in the Miles for the tag team titles. Soriano puts the MF Network title on the line against Mark Cruz, and as mentioned, uh, Twitch here faces Getty Cahoon. All this and more tonight at it's the. It's going to be a graveyard smash because I'm probably going to have to go into a grave it'll, afterwards. It'll be a ringside smash. How about that? Well, you'll be calling the action, so I'm I sure. most certainly will. Uh, all this, all this and more tonight at the MFPW Arena, 541 Mantua Avenue in Paulsboro, New Jersey. Tickets available now at Eventbrite.com. Check out the MFPW and all things Monster Factory on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as at MonsterFactory.org. And check out past matches, bios, bloopers, and more at the MFNetwork.com, which is the home for Monday Night Monsters. Yes, make sure you uh, check out the lighter side of professional wrestling, where you see Ferran and I have the match of the century, sort of. Um, uh, I, I wouldn't go that far. Yeah, I know. It's, maybe, with, with, maybe the shoot fight of the day. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> Tongue-in-cheek, very much. <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Yeah, because I knocked your tongue into your cheek. No, uh, uh, well, no, <laughs> no, you did. <laughs> that was the truth. I actually had a question for for Mr. for Big Ron Shaw. Yes, if it was if if that was okay. Well, it's an interview. I mean, that that's kind of how this well, I mean, thing you're works. I mean, we, well, we're having yeah. I mean, it's it's more conversational, but yeah. I mean, by all means. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, being able to wrestle over in England and uh, in Japan and, and all of that. Um, with the super shows, and I was wondering if you ever 
uh, were able to cross paths with people like Johnny Saint, Rod Robbie Brookside, Fit Finley. Um, no, uh, ever face like a, I guess, a clash of styles in terms well, of who you wrestle. Yeah, I, yeah. In, in the nineties, um, what was strange, and I'll be honest with you, none of those names hardly even ring a bell. I mean, I can, I can remember a couple of times that uh, uh, Mike Sharp came out there. Iron Mike Sharp came out there. A guy named Wild Buck Slattery, and so forth. But uh, no, there's no, there's no way you could compete with those that, that type of a style. Uh, I know they did shows in Mexico, which I never, I never was part of, and that would have been a whole new thing, I'm sure, for me. But you know, you have to understand. Look, I, I've wrestled um, a lot of uh, uh, Japanese wrestlers, and, and you know, they have their type of style also. But you know, you, you can't, you can't uh, try to conform to their style, and they can't. You know, try to you know wrestle the American style, and sometimes they're the hardest matches, you know, to to uh, to do, you know. But uh, you know, they, they were pretty much ended up being brawl matches, mm. and that was the easiest way to easiest way to do them. Oh, there you go. Speaking of brawls, uh, well, yeah, we uh, we kind of talked about it here. Um, uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, I mean, you got a chance uh, from what I was uh, researching to uh, to be involved uh, twice on the what would ended up being televised on MTV, the uh, the brawl to end it all back in uh, in '84. Uh, uh, I believe taking on Sika and also being involved in a battle royal. Oh yeah, abs absolutely. And, and you know what's amazing about it? You know, I mean. The internet is a fantastic thing, and, and you know I've got a lot of videos. And, and matter of fact, I do have the Hulk Hogan match when I first met him. The only problem is, is that the video is so poor, but the audio is as clear as a bell, and it's just not something I'm going to put on my website. But you know, if anybody has that match out there, you know, hey, uh, um, send it to my website. You know, you can go on my website and so forth. But but yeah, that w that was an interesting interesting night, and opening up the card with wrestling Sika, uh, you know, I knew it was going to be a slow match because, you know, you know there, there are the wrestlers I love wrestling with, and, and some of those guys are like Salvatore Palomo, and man, we always had good, fast-paced matches, and B. Brian Blair, Jim Brunzel, and, and the list goes on and on, and, but working with Sika... It's a whole different type of match. Or guys like King Tonga, you know, they're not the high flyers uh, that some of the other guys I had mentioned in the past. So, but but we had a good match. And you know, when when the wrestling fans are into it, that makes it that much easier. I mean, if you if you can get them to boo you, which is what I loved. I loved when they booed me because I knew I was doing my job. Um, uh, it would make for an interesting match. And yeah, the battle royal, which was a uh, uh, a great battle royal. You know, me being in the ring there with uh, and. Antonio Inoki, the great Japanese wrestling star, and, and uh, Rene Goulet, and, which was a, uh, a good ending to that match. I think everybody thought that uh, I was going to win it. No, no, no. no. Uh, obviously, Antonio Inoki, because he took that match that night, that battle royal. And just, I mean, that was just uh, just uh, looking at the card. I mean, it, it's, it's a shame that, uh, the, I mean, the only thing that MTV was interested in was the women's match because of uh, Cindy Lauper uh, and everything involved with it. But, I mean, it's what kind of paved the way for, uh, for things to... Uh things to go forward from there and uh, uh, talk I know we kind of briefly touched upon it uh, be, you know, both of us being uh, current students at the Monster Factory but uh, uh, talk a little bit about your experiences with uh, with pretty boy Larry Sharp well you know la you know as I said you know Larry uh, and I we were, we were both heels um, and I remember the first time I met Larry I think it was uh, in the Landover, Maryland, at the Capitol Center, uh, Gorilla Monsoon gave me a call. I said, Ron, he goes, yeah, can you go down there and, and work tonight? He gave me the directions, blah, 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 and so forth. And I remember hopping in the car with my, my father and so forth. We went down there, and uh, uh, so you're going to be working with Larry Sharp. I said, okay. i got to work as a baby face, obviously, but you know, I was already an established heel. Uh, so we, we, we worked. We worked. We had a, uh, I, I would say it was a so-so match. Um, I, and, and that's sometimes those are the kind of matches you have. And I'm not taking nothing away from Larry. Uh, it was just one of those matches. Uh, but, you know, back in the dressing room, you know, we, we started talking and so forth. And he was helping me out. And I got a lot of help from a lot of people in the business. I mean, you know, uh, the Grand Wizard, Ernie Roth. He, I mean, always, you know, helping me out and, and, and everybody else. I mean, 
and I didn't see that with anybody else. You know, everybody's always giving me advice and so forth. And Larry did. And so, you know, we exchanged phone numbers, and, and uh, he says, hey, he lives in Paulsboro. I think it was Paulsboro, uh, New Jersey at the time. I said, well, hey, you know, I'm from Philadelphia, so let's meet up and drive, you know. But he always wanted to drive every time we would go, and, and we had a great time, you know, getting up to the shows and back. And it was only, always me and him, you know, because I think he pretty much liked to travel alone and, uh, and, and as, as of myself, you know, I always like to travel, you know, by myself most of the time, too, you know, because a lot of the times if we did like a Pennsylvania tour where we'd start out in Harrisburg, do Altoona, and then Pittsburgh, which was the big house show, I would never get to the town the same night. I would take my time, go, go off route somewhere and stay there and then, you know, drive, drive to that town a few hours before the actual show. So, yeah, Larry, Larry was one of the guys I always traveled with and, you know, I miss him. As a matter of fact, I've been watching a lot of his YouTube stuff lately since he passed away, and uh, yeah, he had a great career, no question about it. Yeah, and uh, I was going to say we definitely felt it at the uh, at the Monster Factory, to say the least. And uh, yeah. I was going to say uh, while while I didn't hear anything from the uh, the folks of the internet, I know you were referencing uh, Iron Mike McCord earlier. Uh, he's uh, he eventually went on to become the Universal Heartthrob Austin Idol. That's right. Yes. Couldn't, I just could not think of that name. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, that, no worries. I, I, believe me, if I if I had a dollar for every time I had some sort of mental slip up here, I, I could retire already uh, in the almost <laughs> nine years that I've uh, been doing this doggone thing. I was going to say, well, you know, are we I'm, I'm waiting that to because just I know the show is almost coming to an end, but you haven't asked me about the San Martino match. Well, yeah. If, I mean, if you want to take a uh, take a couple of minutes, I know I, it, it's the thing you always get to. And I figure, you know yeah. what? I mean, pe- I'm sure people can check out other interviews with it. I mean, we yeah, we try to yeah. delve into some of the deeper stuff here. We don't like just you know skimming the surface here. We we like going a little bit deeper, but not in a uh, you know not not in a mean spirited way or anything like that. We you know we cool. just there's yeah. a lot of cool stuff here. You know, you mentioned yeah. people asking for shoot interviews no we're just we're just having a chat and uh and and hearing some cool stuff and uh, keeping it simple in that regard well it, it is old news obviously it happened in 1985 and uh uh you know as i say you know people have had their opinions about it and, and that's all well and fine and i and i gave my opinion about it and as i say they they, they choose and go on my website read about it and and I've done a lot of interviews and so forth about it. But, uh, you know, as I say, you know, I, I think one thing that I will mention is that, you know, when David did an interview about this match maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, you know, I had, I had to read it myself. And I said there were a lot of inaccuracies in there about, you know, him meeting me and, and basically calling me a jobber. And so and that's not what you do. You don't, you don't call another wrestler in this business a jobber. That, that was a term that the fans pretty much used. And, you know, he said he had wrestled me on TV, I don't know how many times, and, and squashed me so many times. Well, you know, we had wrestled only one time when Vince first brought him in, and it was a TV taping in Poughkeepsie, New York. And it was a five-minute match, and all it was, it was hold for hold, counter for counter. I picked him up at the end and gave him a big power slam, a body slam into the mat, and he picked me up for a power slam and pinned me. And... Uh, uh, that was that was it. That, that that was the only time we have ever met until 1985, and when that match happened. And and you know, as I say, uh, I've I've always said there's a lot of people that said you know Ron Shaw did beat the beat the daylights out of him, and some people have said well you know this was pretty much stage planned and et cetera and so forth. But you know, I, I've I have been in a shoot before in pro wrestling and there was a young guy that I had wrestled and he was making me look bad back in my earlier days and he just wouldn't stop and I took him in a reverse arm bar I drove him down to the to the mat and I actually broke either his arm or his shoulder uh, because I was I was really angry and and actually had somebody had wrote about this As a matter of fact it is on my website and uh, but you know <laughs> you know what I'm saying is is that go read what's on my website and uh, you, you form an opinion. In other, in, other, in other words, this is probably one of the biggest mysteries in pro wrestling. And, and you know, look, some have people have said it's the biggest upset in pro wrestling. You know, the WWE has mentioned their big upsets. And, I mean, I'm not on there because those upsets were planned upsets. Okay? Mm. My upset, which is written about every wrestling blog, every wrestling blog is, has written about it, uh, it was not planned. So, you know, take that for what it's worth.
Absolutely. And you can uh, check that out at uh, BigRonShawWWF.com. Ron, I want to thank you for uh, joining us here. I'm down to about, uh, about a minute. Uh, hopefully, uh, I was going to say, we, we, we can see about getting you on here again, And because, uh, I mean, the hour just flew on by here. And I would love to come back. I love just not during hurricane season. Yeah, no, we'll we'll, we'll plan we'll plan better on that here. All right, Ron, thank you very much. Yes, and thank uh, you. We've got uh, I was gonna say forty seconds here for birthdays. All right, I'm, yeah, I'm just I'm, well, okay. you weren't paying attention. You, you could have right. pointed at me. I did. You, me you the were pause. looking down. No, All right. you didn't. Give, you didn't let me. Oh, fine, good. 19, just go with it. This date in mm. 1940, Les Thatcher was born. He turned <gasps> 77 oh. today. Happy birthday, Les. On uh, this date in 1973, MVP Montel yes. Vontavious Porter. On this date oh, in 1980, boy. Christy Hemi. <clears throat> So she's 37. She's not old. And the Brucey <laughs> bonus on this date in 1936, Char- nice. Charlie Daniels from The Devil Went Down to Georgia. He's 81 today. We'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in. Play us out, Nutsy. <laughs> One o'clock in Old Wales. This is your station for local high school sports in Bucks, Mercer, and Burlington counties. 14. 14-